token and now it is just Kemet manufactured product um, that we that we now offered that broadens our our line card so we want to take the time this morning just to give you a little background and uh, some history on where we're going with this product where we see it moving um, trending for new tech new technologies in the future and on the call with me this morning I have Nick Steven who is our distribution technical uh, FAE for distribution uh, he, he will be going through the presentation with you guys this morning so with that Nick I'll turn it over to you and we'll leave a right. few minutes at the end for any questions um, feel free to submit them through the Skype or or just ask at the end when we have a few minutes all right. Thanks, Nick. All right. Thank you, Jeremy and Heather. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nick Steven, and I am the technical marketing engineer here at Kemet Electronics. Uh, and today we'll be talking about magnetic sensors and actuators. So if I were to give this presentation about two years ago, I would have only talked about what's happening on the left. But I'm not going to do that today. So today, everything I'm talking about is happening on the right. A lot of you probably didn't know this, but here at Kemet, we are more than just capacitors now. Uh, we have an expanding range of electromagnetic compatibility solutions, inductors, sensors, piezoelectric devices, supercapacitors, etc. But for this presentation, I'm only going to focus on the electromagnetic compatibility, uh, inductors, sensors, and other actuator products. So let's begin by talking about magnetics. Magnetics products, it's all about the electromagnetic noise. The problem here is EMI, or electromagnetic interference. And we have EMC components, or electromagnetic compatibility solutions, for, uh, for this problem. There's two different types of noise that you can find. Uh, we have the conductive emission, which is usually found uh, on the power line, uh, so to say. Uh, and we have AC line filters and DC line filters for that. We also have radiated emission, which is found in the air. And we have EMI, EMI cores and flux suppressive products. Uh, let's talk about AC line filters. Uh, they're also called chokes or coils. Uh, some people even call it inductors, uh, but we're going to stick with AC line filters for now. If we're looking at the lineup, we have SSR, SSRH, SSHB, SC, SCR, SS, SU, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to torture you guys with all that. We have more than 60 series and more than 1,000 parts. But that's not the story that I want to tell today. I want to talk about what makes Kemet different. So what helps us stand out is the fact that we make the material on our own. So the ferrite material that's used for this material for this product, uh, we create that on our own. So we develop it and we produce it. Depending on the application that you're looking for, we can modify the material however we want. So a while back, the trend used to be who has the highest magnetic permeability. Uh, so magnetic permeability is the ability of a certain ma magnetic material to support the magnetic field development. And the higher the magnetic permeability, the better the material allows for the magnetic flux to pass through. So the 5H, 10H, S15H, and S18H are our proprietary ferrite material names. So the new trend now is for the products to have high temperature. And Kemet having a lot of focus in the automotive industry, uh, we're, we're trying, to, trying to enter this area and support the high temperature market. So currently we have the 5-HT material, which is uh, about 225 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's pretty good, but we're trying to trying to get better every day. Going back to the lineup, uh, going back to the lineup, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, three different products. Uh, but before that, let's look at the application. Uh, so AC line filters can be found in lighting equipment, air conditioner, uh, audio video equipment, uh, a whole bunch of other stuff. Pretty much anywhere 
you need power supply, you can find our AC line filters there. Now let's look at common mode, common mode coils. So the SC type is the first generation of product that we have. Uh, if you look closely, you will see the winding service. And this is literally a guy sitting down and winding the coils manually. For this reason, it's a little expensive, but the trade-off is that you get high inductance for high current. And we can go up to 80 amps for this. Uh, in order to meet the demands for the high volume, we decided to try a machine winding. And that's when we came up with the SU series, which has a U-shaped core. Uh, and the problem with that is uh, the inductance is lower than the manual winding. Then we created the SS series, and the SS stands for square shaped. The benefit here is that uh, we're not breaking the core because if you break it to put the bobbin inside, you lose performance. So what we did is we did it differently. We did it the other way. So we, so we break the bobbin so we don't touch the core. That way we can keep the high inductance with low current. We also, of course, used our high permeability material here and it is now the smallest gear type common mode chokes uh, available on the market right now. Uh, typical application for this would be in lighting equipment, so 25 watts or lower, you can use uh, our common mode chokes. Okay, we also have our SSHB series, which is a dual mode. Uh, dual mode has the capability to uh, take care of a common mode and differential mode all in one coil. Uh, the important feature here is space saving, of course, when you can have two coils in one, uh, that's, that's always a win. Uh, and the temperature goes up to about 130 degrees Celsius. Now we have the normal mode or the differential mode coils. Um, the market for this is very niche uh, because most people use common mode chokes, but we still have a lineup of products to meet the demands of our customers. The interesting thing here is uh, our differential mode it can also act as an inductor. So it's not, so we're not talking about absorption anymore. We can uh, use it to give a boost like in boost converters or DC to DC converters. So here's the quick roadmap of what we have coming. Uh, we already have the the highest permeability material on the market with the S18H. And this is what we're going for in the future when it comes to when it comes to the temperature. Okay, now let's move on to DC line filters. So just like the differential mode, uh, the market for DC line filters are very niche. Uh, but we, we're still going to keep these products uh, to meet the demands for our customers. So the DC line filters, they also use our proprietary ferrite material, and they're suitable for noise countermeasure in DC signal line circuits. Uh, what's interesting is that not a lot of manufacturers are out there making this product anymore. Uh, so uh, for that reason, we're going to continue to keep keep this product and uh, help our customers out. Uh, they're mostly used in uh, audio, visual equipment, power supplies. Okay, now let's go from conducted emission to radiated emission, uh, starting with EMI cores. So what is an EMI core? Uh, it's basically a ferrite attached to a harness and it's used to suppress radiation or uh, and transfer noise in circuit or other systems. Uh, it's uh, it's a for radiated emission like I just mentioned uh, and it and it uh, creates a magnetic field around the cable and the cable can act as an antenna and the magnetic field emits radio wave outside. Uh, so the impedance gets higher based on the number of turns. Uh, if you look at the graph on the bottom, you can see uh, the three-turn EMI core has a higher impedance.
Okay, now let's look at the material used for this uh, for this product. The good news is that we make our own material, like all of our other products. What's interesting to note that uh, the selection process is dependent on the frequency range that you're playing. So uh, whatever frequency range your application or your customer is looking for, uh, that the material depends upon that. So if you're looking at a low frequency application, the manganese is ideal is the ideal material for this. Um, now I'm not sure uh, you're looking at the line at the top, and it looks like the perfect material. That's called a nanocrystal material, which is not a ferrite material. Uh, for this material, we don't we don't we don't produce it on our own. We actually buy it from another from another company. So for this reason, this material is very expensive, and that tends to scare a lot of people away. Uh, here's the lineup of all of our EMI core products. Uh, we have a bunch of different kinds. We have a round cable, bare and coated. Uh, we also have a case type, high heat resistance case, snap-on, black cable, solid and split, and a couple others. So in the lineup, I chose three different products. Uh, we have the snap-on product, which is perfect for nose counter mesh on cables after the design. So you can easily just snap it onto your cable and you'll be good to go. Uh, then we have the low frequency, which is an extension on a product that we had before, uh, but this has the new material in it. And this is currently the best low frequency performance with the manganese zinc material we have. And finally, we have the nano crystal material, which is mainly used for bigger applications, such as uh, general purpose inverters, um, this is used if you have like big cables coming in, uh, so you can use use these cores cores to support that. Another interesting thing we're doing with the nano crystal is uh, we're actually gonna put feet on them, so you can screw it onto the ground. Uh, just something to make make a little bit easier for our customers. The general application area for these are, are for for cables. Uh, we also have automotive solutions available, so they are ACQ200 qualified. All right, now let's move on to flex suppressor. Very, very cool, interesting product. So just a bit of history. Uh, Kemet is the pioneer. In Russian technology started in 1995. Uh, it's basic. It's it's a new material that is better than ferrite, or it can uh, outstrip the limitations of ferrite. Uh, it it suppresses the nose by applying magnetic loss, which I'll talk about shortly. And uh, the application is super simple. You can just uh, peel it off like a duct tape and stick it to wherever the nose nose source is. Okay, so what is a flex suppressor? Uh, it's basically a polymer-based base sheet with micron-sized magnetic dispersed dispersed throughout the material. That's pretty much all I can tell you about it because uh, the rest is secret, and if I tell you, it won't be a secret anymore. Uh, there's there's two different apps for it. Uh, we have the node suppression, and we also have uh, RFID, or radio frequency identification. Uh, these are some of the important features of our uh, flex suppressor. Uh, a wide range of frequencies from megahertz to gigahertz band. Uh, easy installation, uh, there's no limitation on where it can be used. Uh, you can easily cut it into different shapes and, uh, and, it, and it just sticks onto your application wherever it is. Okay, so let's talk about how it works. So you have the current going through the line and you have the magnetic flux around it. Our flex suppressor, there's two different characteristics. So let's talk about permeability again. Could everyone please use their microphones? Oh, there's a lot of, lot of outside noise. Thank you. So the permeability is an important factor when considering a flex suppressor. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, perm permeability is a parameter that shows how much electromagnetic waves a substance can absorb. So permeability includes two different characteristics. We have 
uh, the inductance characteristics or mu prime. Then we also have the resistance or the magnetic loss characteristic, uh, mu double prime. So the mu the mu double prime it it absorbs this high frequency magnetic flux, uh, which is usually the cause of the noise, and it can convert this electromagnetic energy into heat. Now let's look at some of the applications for the magnetic loss pro property. Uh, we have, of course, the most uh, obvious one for EMI regulation. Then we also have another interesting application, which is for descents. Uh, for example, this, this happens in your phone or laptops. Uh, there's a lot of sensitive parts uh, inside your uh, electronics that needs to be protected. So you can use uh, our flex suppressor sheet to clean up all the noise from all the other components inside. And we can also use it for uh, electrostatic discharge. Now looking at the mu prime uh, inductance characteristic, uh, this is mostly found for wireless power transfer or RFID. Uh, so here we have magnetic flux. Uh, I guess you can say the, the wireless uh, the wireless uh, power transfer process, and the flux is being disturbed by the metal or uh, other components outside. And you can use your flux suppressor sheet to keep the flux clean or to keep the flux bigger. Uh, a good example for this would be in subway cards. Uh, so back in the day, you would have had to pull out your subway card to scan it. Uh, these days, you can just leave it in your uh, leave it in your wallet, and you can just scan the wallet, and you'll be good to go. So that's, that's an interesting application of our RFID sheets. Another interesting one is for uh, charger cables. So you can also find our flex suppressor sheet in a real, real type that you can use to wrap around cables and that can uh, suppress the radiated noise from the cable. So here's the lineup of uh, all of our flex suppressor series. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, different different forms. They come in roll or they come in sheets, and the permeability values are different for uh, for uh, for each of them. And this basically shows the application or the main market area of our flex suppressor. As you can see, you can find them in. A lot of consumer electronics, such as um, mobile phones, laptops, navigation systems, or uh, cameras, tablet, etc. They are also found in uh, automotive applications. So, for vehicle entertainment, uh, they're used in meter cluster, uh, displays. Thank you. Nick, we can't hear you. How about now? Yep, yep you're, you're back. But Perfect. I think maybe there was a couple slides, I think, that maybe a couple we missed. Slides. Yeah. Right there. Okay, so we can find our flex suppressor sheets uh, in automotive applications. Uh, they are EACP 200 qualified. Uh, they are mostly used in meter clusters, uh, head-up displays, uh, your camera, or navigation system. Okay, that's it for flex suppressor. Now let's move on to EMI RFI filters. We do have a bunch of different shapes for EMI R5 filters, so depending on the application, you, you can pick which one you want. Uh, we have metal, we have cylinder, plastic, uh, we even have an SMB version, which is a miniaturized version and that is reflow capable. 
uh, and we also have the inlet filters. And here's a lineup of uh, EMI R5 filters. Um, as you can see, that it's very low current, and the market is very limited for this product. Uh, this shows the application of our EMI R5 filters. Uh, they're mostly used in uh, electronic equ equipment or industrial equipment. Um, there's not much to say about EMI R5 filters right now. Uh, hopefully next time I'll have uh, more information for you guys. The next product we have is a pulse transformer for HP PLC. Well, what is a PLC? Well, it's basically a power line communication. So uh, a PLC, it can use existing power lines to transmit signals. Uh, the good thing about this is you don't need new infrastructure, but the bad news is the world is more wireless now. So there's a lot of wireless connectivity happening right now. But we still do have a lot of opportunities in the industrial space where a lot of power lines are still being used. So in the U.S., we have the home plug. Uh, we have uh, we also have HDPLC by Panasonic, and we have UPA that's happening in Europe. So you guys might have customers that use the HDPLC from Panasonic, uh, which is a power line communication technology, and we developed this product, the Pulse Transformer product that goes with the PLC. And for this reason, we are on their reference designs. So if a customer is doing an HD PLC design, our product is the best fit for this. Um, we have two part numbers. We have a 100 volt and a 200 volt, uh, depending on the region uh, you're in. Uh, you can pick, pick whichever one. Okay, now let's go to power inductors. So we took all of the power inductors and rebranded them as metal composite, and that stands for metal composite. Mm. Where's my stinking badge? Guys, can everyone uh, please mute their microphone? So when we first got into this inductor space, uh, everyone was asking about it. Um, they were asking if we have the Vichet IHLP or uh, is it automotive, ACQ200 qualified, and unfortunately our answer was no. So all of our inductor products uh, in the beginning uh, were for a very niche market. So we're mostly focused on laptops or other electron uh, other consumer electronics like gaming equipment or cell phones, etc. So the main requirement for an inductor is to have low loss. That's because it can have longer battery life lifetime and this can be achieved by a specific low loss, low core product. So that's the direction we started going, and now we have a lot of customers, a lot of big name customers in this product. Now the next step was to keep the idea of the low loss and go for a higher temperature uh, so we can get into this automotive market. This shows uh, what we had in the past and what we have today. Uh, as you can see, we have inductors for a PC and servers, and uh, we also have And we also have uh, automotive grade. And once again, all the material used uh, for, for these inductors are unique to Kim. So now we're moving away from the past uh, where we were only focused on laptops and consumer electronics. Uh, and now we have uh, automotive grade, small footprint, low profile, and uh, higher current parts. And this is where all our focus will be for the future. So our power inductors for uh, automotive applications, they're mostly used in electric water pump or electric oil pump, uh, and they can go up to 155 degrees Celsius. If you look on the bottom right, uh, it shows the structure of our power inductor, and uh, it's basically a winding of the coil, and you put the metal composite in it, and it presses it, and that's how you get the that's perfect for automotive applications, but when it comes to servers, you need something higher current and something that can be in seven days a week. So that's when we brought back our old ferrite material, and 
And instead of this metal composite powder that I was talking about, this uses our ferrite material, which is a unique structure of a one-turn coil. Because of this one-turn coil, it gives it a low D DCR or DC resistance. And the ferrite material gives us a low core loss. When combining all of that and being able to go for large current, uh, we pretty much achieve the challenge of having low self-heating, which is uh, what gives you long battery life. And this is exactly the type of product that we need for servers and storage applications, and also for uh, many IoT applications that's coming up. Like I mentioned, they're mostly used for uh, uh, servers and storage, um, such as DC to DC converters, uh, and the two different products are TPI and MPLCG series. So here's some interesting news. Uh, we have an exciting product launch coming up in a couple of days, and that is our MPX series power inductors. Uh, earlier, I talked about the Vichet IHLP, and if we have anything that's uh, similar to that, and the MPX series is, uh, is what uh, what's close to the IHLP. Uh, they're mostly used in high frequency DC to DC converters, uh, PC and servers, uh, FPGA, etc. So for the MPX series, uh, in the past, these are some of our current power inductor offerings. And with this new new product launch, we'll address the need of the popular inductance needs and footprints such as these. So be on the lookout for our new product launch video coming out uh, in just a couple of days. And be sure to follow Chemical Electronics on all social media platforms to stay up to date. Okay, now we'll move on to sensors. Uh, we'll start off with proximity sensors. We have a couple other sensors as well, but let's start with the proximity sensor, which is, uh, which is the most popular one. So our, pro our proximity sensor, uh, also known as pyroelectric sensor, they are basically a short distance human detection sensor. Before we talk about the sensor, let's quickly cover what pyroelectricity is. So pyroelectricity can be described as the ability of certain materials to generate small voltages when they're heated or cooled. And uh, our pyroelectric sensor or proximity sensor, they use this pyroelectric effect of ceramic to detect the infrared energy from human body. Some of the important features are their SMD reflow capable, uh, they're really compact and low profile, and the most important feature of them all is that they are low they are low power consumption. It's all about energy saving. So our, a typical infrared sensor, uh, they're powered on continuously, and they generate a beam. And when something crosses the beam, it can detect it. So, uh, so this infrared sensor, it's powered on continuously, and as you can imagine, uh, it's wasting a lot of energy. But with our proximity sensor, it only turns on when the human when a human enters its range. So it can detect the body heat and it'll start working. There is a couple of different things you can do with our uh, proximity sensor to tweak your detection. So our typical standard distance pyro sensor is about two meters. It can also detect through polyethylene material, which reduces the range down to about one to two meters. Then we also have a middle middle distance sensor uh, with the lens. Now, here's another important feature. Uh, a lens is not required for our proximity sensor, but if you do decide to go with the lens, it can increase your range up to about five meters. And we also have a new product uh, that can detect through resin or glass. Now keep in mind the detection level for this sensor, it depends on the type of material and the color and the thickness of the glass or the material that, it, that it's sensing through. Now let's look at some of the interesting application areas for this. Um, so for our proximity, sense, uh, proximity distance of about two meters, uh, the interesting application here is for IC key door, uh, key door application. Uh, a good example for this would be in uh, hotel rooms or big apartment complexes. So usually when you're when you're in a hotel room, the door module, it's continuously sending out beams to detect the key. 
if our if our proximity sensor is installed, the door module will only turn on when the guest approaches the room with the key. So this can save a lot of energy if, if it's implemented all over the hotel room. Now the middle distance sensor, uh, which is about five meters, they're mostly found in uh, conference room lightings or heaters or business phones, et cetera. And we also have the very short distance sensor, which is uh, found all around you uh, in bathroom hand dryers, home appliances, air cleaners, and uh, many other applications. So our proximity sensor, it is now packaged in our module solution. So it comes with a microcomputer, a circuit board, and the optional lens. A driver is not required for this module because it's already included in the package, uh, which makes the sensor uh, plug in sense. So the application is super simple. Um, all the driving is already being done for you. Okay, now let's move on to our current sensor. So we have the ZCT series, uh, which is a compact molded type zero phase current transformer. Uh, they're mostly used to improve sensitivity or the compactness and the weight of electric shock prevention. And uh, some of the applications, as you can see here, is uh, used for electric shock prevention from earth leakage breakers, short circuit relays, and ground fault circuit interrupters. We have the C CT series, uh, which is a low alternating current sensor, and it's used to detect uh, very low current levels and for overcurrent protection in electronic devices. We also have the C slash CT series, which is the same as the CT series, but it's a clamp-on type. Uh, so the clamp-on current sensor, it can be used to measure uh, currents in live wires. So this is used for, uh, for applications after your design is already being done. And we have the uh, current transformer magnetic direct current sensor, uh, which can detect uh, DC current and also uh, alternating current and also pulse current. The typical application for this would be for uh, inverter-based home appliances, such as air conditioners, uh, general purpose inverters, uh, industrial machines, uh, UPS, and DC motor controls. All right, now we have our thermal read switch. So a lot of people are wondering if this is a switch or if it's a sensor. Well, it's not gonna tell you the temperature in degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit, but it can react to the temperature and work as a switch. So let's talk more about that. So our the Kemet's thermal read switch, uh, it has a design that features a magnet and a temperature sensing ferromagnetic substance called the thermal right. But before we talk about the thermal right, let me define what a Curie temperature is, because that's important to know uh, for our thermal read switch. So at a, t at a certain temperature, a permanent magnet can lose all of its magnetic properties. And Kemet took advantage of this technique, and we created a material whose Curie point can be controlled and adjusted. And we decided to call that material thermal right. Now, this thermal right material is used in creating a thermal switch that can open and close. Uh, when a specific and tightly controlled temperature is reached. So that's how our uh, thermal read switch works. Some of the features there, uh, they have high reliability. They have excellent environmental resistance. Uh, they are encased in a glass tubing, so uh, it can uh, prevent it from dust, explosion, and corrosion. Uh, no special circuit design required, and we have a wide temperature setting range. There's two different types of thermal read switch. We have the OHD series thermal guard, and we have the TRS series thermal read switch. The main difference here is the operating temperature tolerance. So the OHD series can go up in five degrees Celsius increments, and the TRS goes up in uh, 2.5 degrees Celsius increments. Some of the application areas, uh, it's mostly used in industrial equipment, so the machinery can operate with uh, with minimal human supervision. Um, so, for example, 
in an in industrial setting, there's a lot of machines that operate throughout the day, and they tend to overheat a lot. So with our thermal sensor, if the machine heats up past a certain limit, our, our, our switch can activate and turn off the equipment to avoid any accidents. And just like that, when the machine cools down to a certain limit, it can turn, turn the machine back on. So the human interaction with the machine is very minimal. All right, the last section, let's talk about piezoelectric devices. So we have three different types of piezoelectric devices. Uh, we have our transducer, we have acoustic module, and we also have a piezoelectric uh, actuator. Let's quickly define what the piezoelectric effect is. Uh, so basically, piezoelectric effect is the ability of certain materials to take mechanical energy and convert them into electrical energy. So for example, we have pressure, shock, sound wave, uh, displacement, they can all be converted into voltage. Just like that, we also have the inverse piezo effect, which can take the voltage and convert, or the electrical energy and convert it into mechanical energy. So we can take the voltage and uh, turn it into displacement, sound, force, vibration, and any other mechanical energy. Okay, here's an interesting scenario. Uh, what's interesting to know here is we have a one micrometer displacement at one kilovolt voltage for a one millimeter thickness piezo ceramic material. That's a very small displacement. Uh, you can use resonance frequency to amplify the vibration, which is still very small because resonance frequency, it only increases it 10 times, and that's still very small. So how can we increase this displacement or vibration? So Kemet has a couple of different solutions that you can use for this. We have uh, our horn structure, uh, or what we call the Langevin Fulton structure. We have the bimorph actuator, which uses the bending characteristics of the ceramic. Or finally, we have uh, the layering solution uh, that I'll talk about shortly. You can also use the expansion tool, but we're not in this market as of now. Uh, so we'll, we'll skip over that part. Okay, so looking at the piezo Langevin Bolton transducer, uh, so why exactly do you need to use the transducer? So how this works is you put the piezo element in the middle and it's almost like a ceramic capacitor. When there's too much current going in, it will crack. So if you have a high current, high power application, you can use uh, the Langevin Bolton transducer. Uh, because of this horn structure, you can avoid uh, the, the ceramic cracks that I mentioned earlier, and due to the high high power uh, operations and ultrasonic collision impact, uh, it's used for ultrasonic cleaning. So uh, Kemet's Langevin type transducers are used wherever uh, powerful powerful ultrasonic waves must be generated, and for application flexibility and uh, to make it easy for our customers, these transducers are mounted in a structure where you can pretty much bolt it on anywhere. All right, let's move on to our multi-layer actuators. Um, so our piezo actuators, they actually use the inverse piezo effect. So it takes electrical energy and it converts it into mechanical energy. So in this case, it's taking the voltage and converting it into displacement. So compared to a conventional piezoelectric actuator, uh, our actuators are smaller in size, but they can generate higher displacement and forces at low voltages. Uh, we have two different types. We have the metal sealed actuators, uh, which uh, which is inside a metal casing, so it can it can protect it from humidity due to the metal structure, uh, which gives it a long operational life and high performance. They're mostly used in reliability applications such as uh, semiconductor device production, uh, equip uh, other equipment, and uh, optical communication equipment. Now we also have the resin coated, which is pretty much the same as the metal sealed. Uh, all you have to do is just open it up, and you will find the resin coated. Uh, of course, don't try to open it. Uh, that wouldn't be good. 
Uh, they're used in more compact solutions such as uh, positioning and optical systems, uh, mass flow valves, and vibration sources. Let's quickly look at the structure of our piezo, uh, piezo actuators. Um, so our competitors, they use the monolithic, monolithic electrode construction, which is similar to an MLCC construction. Um, it's a layering system, but when the force is applied on the surface, uh, we create a lot of stress areas, which reduces the lifetime. With our piezo actuator, we actually have a glass layer insulation, and it's uniform throughout the, throughout the material. Uh, we call this a plate through electrode. And when the force is applied, it's going on the whole surface. By doing so, we can avoid uh, all the stress concentration areas, uh, and they'll have high operation durability and high performance. Some of the technical advantages of our actuators when compared to some of the other actuators in the market. Um, so against electromagnetic actuators, Against electromagnetic actuators, well, we have faster response times, uh, large generator floors, and low power consumption. And of course, there's no electromagnetic noise. Uh, against bimorph, uh, bimorph actuators, which are the bending actuators that I'll talk about shortly, uh, they're low power consumption with large generator floors, and they, they have 100 times the response speed of the bimorph actuators. And against the stack actuators, they're compact in size, low drive voltage, and inexpensive. Some of the applications for our PSU actuators, uh, they're mostly found in mass, mass flow controller, uh, positioning tools, semiconductor equipment, uh, a lot of, a lot of medical, medical equipment such as endoscope camera, optical communication, and uh, for, for semiconductor equipment. Now there there is a concern when it comes to comes to price of this product, uh, but you always had to pick quality over the price. And for applications such as mass flow controller uh, and medical equipments, which are critical applications, you definitely need quality products. We are the industry leader in this technology with uh, more than thirty years of experience, so we are definitely the best in the market when it comes to uh, the actuator technology. And finally, we have the acoustic module, which is a very interesting, interesting product. So our piezo acoustic module, they use the bending, bending effect or the bimorph effect of, of the piezo ceramic. Um, so what you do is you take the piezo ceramic material and you make it a little bit longer and you can put it on any chassis you'd like, and it will start, and the chassis will start making sound. So it basically acts as a receiver and a speaker. The main application for this would be for uh, the main application for this would be for smartphones, where you want your device to have the best sound quality as possible. So you can uh, use the acoustic module and actually turn your smartphone chassis into a speaker, so you can uh, you can get more out of it. Uh, in the future, this product can be used in IoT applications with uh, more and more voice commands coming into play, uh, so such as uh, Amazon Alexa and Google Home, etc. Uh, and just like our Flex Suppressor, uh, they're easy to install. It's pretty much like a tape, so you can peel it off and stick it on your chassis. Uh, and they're very compact and low profile. And they're also suitable uh, for uh, waterproof and dustproof designs. Uh, our acoustic modules, they're very easy to remember. We only have one part number, so just remember R11. Uh, they have a resonance frequency of 5 kilohertz, uh, and the application area is for uh, receiver and speakers. So here is a driving circuit uh, reference de design from Texas Instruments. Uh, as you can see, it uses our R11 series uh, acoustic module. And it's a fairly simple circuit, and you can, and the application is very easy for this. All right, that concludes my presentation for today. If you're interested in learning more, you can uh, go to our component search tool.
Uh, we also have Engineering Center, which has a lot of different technical blogs and other white papers uh, and other resources on all the products that I talked about today. So you can go to search.chemit.com for Component Edge. Um, engineering Center is ec.chemit.com. We also have our capacitor assimilation tool, which is also top of the industry, and you can find that at ksim.chemit.com. All right, do we have any questions? Hey, Nick. So before we open it up to questions to everybody, I have a, I have a few questions, as well as a few that have come through on the text. Uh, so the first, the first question is, uh, if I sell a Metcom MPX power inductor, what other parts can be cross-sold with that? Okay, so the Metcom MPX, they're, they're heavily used in DC to DC converter. So um, when you're designing a DC to DC converter, they usually have ball capacitors or bypass capacitors. So you can use our KO cap, which is Chemit Organic Capacitors, um, uh, and you can also use our MLCCs. And depending on the power levels, there, there could be other EMI solutions, such as a flex suppressor and maybe even EMI R5 filters, depending on the application, of course. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, the second question is, does Kimmet offer uh, different color lenses for the proximity sensor? And if so, does that have an effect on the detection range? Uh, yeah, we do have a couple different color for the lenses. Uh, so we have the neutral color lens, or it's, it's a clear lens. Uh, we also have a black lens, and we have a white lens. Uh, when it comes to the detection range, if you, if you decide to go with the lens, the range is about 5 meters. Uh, now, there might be a little bit of fluctuation depending on the color of the lens, but in general, 5 meters is, is pretty accurate for, for our sensors. And then, uh, do you need a driver circuit for our thermal read switch? You do not need a driver circuit for our thermal read switch. Uh, it, it is a standalone operation part, uh, just like all of our other sensors. So we like to make it easy for our customers, and this is also a plug-in sense sensor. Okay. And then we had a question come through on the text. Um, Sam was kind of helping us out with these, but um, a question came through from Leo. Is the flex suppressor conductive on the top side? Uh, Sam was able to answer that and, and let him know that it, the flex suppressors are non-conductive. Uh, also, there's a question of how much isolation does it provide, i.e. 500 volts. I think we needed some clarification uh, on that question. Uh, then Matt came through and asked what the cost was for the, the pyro sensors. I provided that information back to Matt. You, Arrow currently has these in stock online, uh, but the cost, Arrow's cost on those is, is 308. Two dollars and eight cents, and then how do they compare to PIR? Uh, might need some clarification on that one as well, as our pyro sensors are um, uh, infrared proximity sensors. So, yep. um, not not sure which you mean by how do they compare? Um, and then Leo asks, how accurate are the current sensors? So Nick, if you want to elaborate on that. How accurate are our current sensors? Uh, I would say they're pretty accurate. Um, do you have uh, more of an answer for that? Uh, they're supposed to be accurate to um, IEC 61869-1, which, if I'm not mistaken, is 0 0.5 or 1%, uh, but we'd have to check on that to confirm. Okay. Thank you. And now we'll open it up if anybody else on the call has, has any questions. All right. Well, if you get if you do have questions in the future, please feel free to reach out uh, to Nick or myself. You also have um, a local Kimmet sales team and an FAA team that is available to answer any questions you may have in the future as well. Um, and then we'll make sure we get this uh, a copy of this presentation available to you to reference back uh, if you have any questions in the future. Uh, the answer to the new uh, question yes. that just came in, yes, they are all design registrable. 
Yeah, so all of our MSA products are design registrable. And they should reflect in our system, Leo. It, it drives from the price file, so there should be the flag when you look up a part. So it should be good there. And when it comes to the MPX power inductors, Jeremy, uh, Arrow will have that in stock soon? Yeah, so Arrow has all of them set up. Uh, there, there are some buy constraints right now um, with with ordering new product, but you will have those available um, soon. All right, perfect. And yes, I see another um, chat come through. I'll send out everybody the presentation after the fact and um, the slide deck, and we'll see how the recording worked out. So you should have that here in a bit. I'll send it out to everybody that I sent the invite to. Okay. Anything else? Anybody have any more questions? All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your time this morning. We really appreciate it. Kimmich is putting a large focus on growing this uh, MSA business. Um, currently, Arrow is the number one market shareholder within this uh, space in the channel, so we do appreciate your help and support uh, through that, and we want to continue growing it. So you will see throughout the year more focus, more presentations, more trainings uh, on this product as we are releasing more products uh, continually within the MSA Business Group. So again, thank you for your support. Thank you for your time this morning. And if you have any questions, you have the uh, contacts to reach out and ask those questions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.